It's really a great honor to be here. It's an honor to be celebrating the Center for the Study of Human Rights in the Americas, to be here on its fifth anniversary, and to honor the work of um, this center in gathering the testimony of prisoners speaking for themselves, of guards speaking for themselves. And tonight, um, as Amrindo Ojeda said, putting the two together, guard and prisoner for the first time before an American audience. This truly is historic. I don't want to spend much time talking myself because, well, doing broadcasts every day, Monday through Friday, I know how tenuous it is when you make a connection with someone somewhere else, and I want to take full advantage of our connection to Omar Degay's. Um, and to be able to hear his description of his own experience and then to speak with Mustafa Abdullah, Terry Holbrooks, and hear what he has to say and also listen to them speak to each other. Uh, this truly is a very important moment. So without further ado, we're going to begin with... Omar de Gates, who is sitting in a video conference room in Brighton, England. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to first uh, thank everyone that invited me to, to speak to all of you, and uh, especially El Mirando and the people who organized this. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to speak to all of you today. And it's, it's so I'm have so happy to to see Terry on the other side, where I've seen him before, when I was inside the cell and he was at the outside of the cage. And then uh, I met him once here in, in England. He came here, and we met. And uh, he's he's a he's a respectable personality. He's a very good man that I respect. Uh, I I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, there isn't much to say about what, uh, how, how it is in Guantanamo, how it feels in Guantanamo, other than uh, my name is Omar de Gaes, and I was, uh, it's a long story that uh, how I, I was caught up in all this. Uh, I traveled, I traveled to, to the Far East for many reasons. One of the reasons I've just uh, finished a law graduation and was hard work and I wanted a break uh, I wasn't allowed to go back to my own country. I lived most of my life here in, in England. So I was earning, yearning for, for going to a, a place which is similar in culture to my own country because I came to, before I lived a different life. And uh, when I came to age in this country, I started to think about traveling to, to countries like mine. I wasn't able to go back to my own country. So I went to the Far East for many reasons. One of the reasons this, other reasons I had uh, friends who invited me to come to Malaysia and India and I, I was searching for work in, in Malaysia with my friends and, and many reasons. So when I went there, I, I went to Af Pakistan and uh, eventually went to Afghanistan. Was uh, The entry to Afghanistan was, uh, you didn't require any visas to go to Afghanistan. I heard Taliban were at the time big news and they were always in the news and the rule of Sharia and how the Sharia laws and so on. So it interests me because of my background, I'm a law graduate. I went to Afghanistan to see because you didn't need any visa, you didn't need anything, you just, uh, you could, you were able to do that just by crossing the borders. I went to Afghanistan, I met my wife there, I'm, I'm married to, to an Afghani wife. I like the place. All this happened long time before September 11. When September 11 happened, uh, people, I mean, uh, e everywhere inside Afghanistan was bombarded by planes. And I felt for the safety of my small family, uh, just born, I had a newborn child. So we left Afghanistan to come back here to England. When we were in Pakistan, the American uh, authorities, the government of Bush at the time was paying lots of money to, to people, any people who would hand them any Arab, they were buying Arabs from Pakistan. So we rounded up in our villa, in our house, uh, we were uh, captured and then taken to lockups. 
where we were uh, mistreated in Pakistan and then sold to the Americans after a while we were sold to the Americans uh, uh, and uh, so what I ended happened? up uh, Omar Degues, what yeah. happened to your wife and child? My wife and child uh, I was uh, I was very concerned about them because I didn't know what happened to them in the beginning uh, I was smuggling letters to their fathers in Afghanistan when I was in prison they were themselves locked up in another house and uh, I, I knew afterwards that this is what happened to them so I sent the letter, I smuggled the letter from prison to their father in Afghanistan to come and collect them which uh, he was able to do. He came in uh, and he eventually uh, took them back to Afghanistan. And where so, were you brought to? And then after that I was, as I say, I was uh, kept in prison for two months in Pakistan, mistreated and then sold, uh, handed to the Americans in uh, Islamabad airport. We were, our heads were covered and then we were handed to to two Americans, we didn't know at the time because our heads were covered by black, but, uh, black uh, bags. So we handed and then some two people roughly pulled us out in the airport and then they've changed, they, they, they stopped us in front of a mirror somewhere in the airport, in the toilet of the airport, and they've changed the bag, the, the black bag from my head and they put another worse bag, more thicker bag, the way you, you can't breathe properly. When they took the bag off, you, I could see in the mirror there were two Americans so it was another transformation from Pakistan to, to American uh, abduction. So they took us from Pakistan to Bagram base, where we again were badly mistreated. Bagram base is, uh, Bagram base is now in the news because Bagram base, I want to say, and it was a lot worse than Guantanamo Bay. Uh, treatment in Bagram is and still is worse than uh, what went in Guantanamo Bay. And we were uh, badly Again, mistreated in Bagram for another two months, and then transferred to Guantanamo to Guantanamo uh, Bay. Oh, While we were, when you said you you kept referring to we, who else were you imprisoned with uh, when you were taken from Islamabad Airport to Bagram? Well, what, what I, when I say we, it's like because there was lockups. We were put in lockups. They seem to be private lockups. They're not a military. They're not military. Uh, prisons, nor are they a normal police prisons. They were lockups, and they were more than, uh, they were a group of people. They, every time they, they picked up somebody from the streets, an Arab, and they brought, brought him to this lockup, and then they interrogated, uh, the Pakistanis tortured him, and then either they've given him, sold him to the Americans, because they were a, an American group of people who we met in Pakistan, who came and interviewed us, or came to meet us first in Pakistan. And they asked certain questions, and then they probably decided whether to buy someone or not. And some people they bought like me, and they took us from there to Guantanamo. And some people they didn't see uh, that they were worth; uh, they didn't buy them, so they were weren't released. But they were sent back to their own countries, where some of them were, uh, if they were to be returned to their own countries, they were. As we heard afterwards, they, some of them died, were killed in prison, some of them are still locked up in prison because they were wanted people, because uh, some of them were, for example, living all their lives in Pakistan for a long time, since the very old uh, Russian war against Afghanistan. Some of them were participation or participated in that war. And because of that, they were considered by their own countries in the Middle East as uh, terrorists and bad people. So they couldn't go back from Pakistan to their own country. This was like more than 20 years ago. And uh, because of that, they were living in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So when they were picked up by the Pakistanis to sold to the Americans, the Americans realized they didn't need these people, they didn't, they didn't want them. So the Pakistanis sold them to their own Arab countries, some of them in Egypt, some of them to Libya, some of them to Tunisia and so on. So after that, as I say, we ended up in, in Guantanamo and everybody knows what happened in Guantanamo Bay. Can you talk about what happened to you um, first in Bagram and then Guantanamo because uh, of course you have lived this yourself and you've retold the story but for people in the United States I think we know very little about what actually goes on there okay uh, it, start, it starts from Pakistan in Pakistan these lockups 
where when we were locked up, we were taken to different locations, private locations. They were not, we're not taken to police stations, but usually we're taken out to private locations, different villas, different hotel rooms, where we were met by American people, American personnel wearing civilian clothes. Uh, at one time, one of them introduced himself as the head of the CIA, Libyan section, and he said he was a Libyan in the 60s, and he even... Uh, heard about my father and he said he was a noble man that he knew about him when he was a Libya and things like that. So we met them and they were Can you in Pakistan. Can you explain for a sec what your father had done in Libya? You're from Libya and... Oh. My father is a, a well-known lawyer in Libya and he, he was fighting for Libyan independence and uh, he was a, a well-known politician, one of the first lawyers in the country and he was afterwards, uh, because of his opposition to Gaddafi's uh, dictatorship, he was uh, assassinated and killed, and because of that, we afterwards, the whole family was harassed and mistreated in Libya when we were young children, about my age was 10. I had younger brothers and younger sisters and, and older brothers. Some of them were six years old, so we were badly mistreated. We had demonstrations in front of our house and so on. So my mother felt afraid for our safety. She took us all and, and uh, she really ran away to, uh, to come and live in this country because it was a place where we used to come here to learn English. Uh, so this is the story of my father and he was a well-known politician at the time in the 60s and 50s. So uh, this man, he introduced himself to the CIA, he said he, he knew my father and he, was, uh, and he asked me a couple of questions about uh, opposition leaders, polit political opposition leaders who are well-known in the Libyan uh, opposition just to start a conversation and then he started to ask why I was there and what happened and he was asking lots of questions. And I think he had some another person assistant with him. They were finding out whether I was worth, I think, worth money, the money they're paying or not. And we had that kind of meeting happen twice in Islamabad. And they were in control of those lockups in Islamabad because we were taking to meet them. And then if they said something like, if they said, I want you today to write down this or do this. They'll take you back to the lockup and the Pakistanis, you think that the Pakistanis didn't know anything because they don't, they're not present in the meetings. The Pakistanis are not present in those private meetings. So when we go back to the lockups, the Pakistanis come and they say, you, they, they give you the same instructions that the American man gave you. And if you don't do them, obviously they will torture you, beat you up and things like that. And uh, Were you ever waterboarded? In, in Pakistan, what happened was in, uh, it, it was like, um, not waterboarding, but uh, it's like a big bucket of water and then they drown you inside it, they put your head down inside it. This happened to me in Pakistan. But uh, I, the, the closest I came to something like drowning, waterboarding in American possession was in Guantanamo. Everybody in Guantanamo, if you can continue to fight back the guards who, there were five guards who come to your cell and sometimes come in and wearing uh, gear, uh, you know, riot gears, and they come in and beat you up badly if you, if, if you just objected to certain orders. Sometimes they make commands which are very humiliating and they expect you to oppose it, like take off your trousers or do something really stupid or they come out for search, which is sometimes they do it sexually, they do some sexual abuse in it. So they realize that you either would object to it and then it's a chance for them to come in with five guards to beat you up badly. Or if you say yes and you consent to it, then uh, it's like psychological, uh, you, you become psychologically like disturbed because you didn't object to it. So we object to those kind of, uh, uh, those kind of uh, conduct. So what happens, they come in and beat you up badly and then they hold you down to the floor, your hands tied uh, behind your back and then they have a tube of water where they drown your face until you suffocate from that. And uh, they, say, stop, they, they, they say to you, stop resisting, stop resisting, because what they mean by that is uh, if, if they command you to do something, you have to do it. This is, this is something that is uh, always happening in Guantanamo. This is not waterboarding as we know it, but it's something else. They drown you by water in a different way than waterboarding. This is the nearest the waterboarding thing. Omar Degay, what happened to your eyes? 
Uh, it's the same thing, you know, it's uh, making a story short, is that five people came into my cell. We were in isolation blocks called, uh, uh, it's called, uh, not November, it's called... October. Uh, no, no, not November, the other one is uh, Oscar. We were in uh, isolation blocks in Oscar, and they wanted to make an, make an example of us and to frighten other people. There was a big riots going on. It was under General, General Miller at the time. They came into my cell, making it short, they came into my cell and uh, five people, as I say, I was fighting back. So when I pushed them in the corridors, fighting with them in the corridors, uh, when they held me down, they chained me and then uh, one, one guard was holding my head, the other guard was sat down and he pushed two of his fingers inside both of my eyes and there was an officer standing above him and as more he pushed his fingers, I didn't because I didn't scream, he thought he wasn't doing enough, so he was pushing more his fingers inside my eyes. And the officer was telling him to do more because he couldn't hear me shouting. Uh, after that, he, he pulled his uh, fingers away and uh, my eyes, both of my eyes, uh, I, I, they were, I, had, I had water coming out from both of my eyes. I lost, I lost sight of both of my eyes. Uh, I take him to the wreck yard, and then again, this water stuff happened, you know, they, they put you inside water, suffocate, and then they threw me back inside the cell. I couldn't see from both of my eyes for a couple of days, and then uh, I regained sight in the left eye. The right eye, uh, I had uh, a minor injury when I was young, so I was weaker than the left eye. Uh, I kept losing sight, it went worse and worse, until now I, can't, I can hardly see from my right eye. I can only like uh, detect light and things like that. I was, as I say, I was physically, it was like physically abused. When you say physically abused, it's like my fingers, I was, my fingers are crushed by an officer until the bones, he closed the bean hole on my finger until he crushed it to, as again, to say stop, because I was trying to stop him from spraying this uh, pepper on my face and in the room. Uh, another incident, I was beaten badly, my nose was broken because they said he keeps fighting back, let's break his effing nose, so they put me down to the floor and start kicking by their boots and punches until they broke my nose. I have, uh, my ribs are badly battered because of uh, some of these incidents. This is the physical abuse, but the psychological abuse that went on and the psychological engineered schemes that went on are a lot worse and more deeper wounds than the physical abuse. Can you describe what the psychological abuse was? And also, how long, Omar Degues, were you held at Guantanamo? I was locked up in Guantanamo for about six years, so five years and seven months. But uh, remember, there are people still locked up there, which is now nearly nine years. Uh, nearly a decade without being charged of anything and never being convicted of anything they're not being charged and it's been nine years one of them is a, a colleague of mine who lives here in London his name is Shakir Amir he's, he hasn't even seen one of his uh, youngest uh, kids his name is Faris I've never seen his father and now he's about nine years old so that's that's uh, I'm sure that's hard on people who are in prison there can you describe what happened to you psychologically at Guantanamo? Uh, you, you know, it's it just extremes. You see, you see the extreme ugliness of of uh, people, worst things that can happen. I didn't before Guantanamo. I never thought that people can be uh, deeply cruel to each other to that extent, even even if they were their enemies. Because we kept saying to them, even to the interrogators, we kept saying, even if we were your enemies and you've convicted us of anything, which they haven't, uh, I don't, we don't see how, why is it for six years, your uh, demand for revenge is like deeply continuous and you're doing all these kind of things. We can understand the first year, the second year, we can understand you want to you are reacting to something deep, but to continue that kind of treatment, to continue for seven years, because what they had, they had a system where, where like six to seven years, like uh, Terry will tell you, like six to seven months or one year, they'll change the guards. 
the, the guys don't stay there. They have to change them every time. They change the whole system. And they have, every time they have a new engineered uh, policy to cause really deep harm, like sexual abuse, they come up with some sexual stupid stuff, they come up with something that would really irritate people. And that was continuous. It wasn't like first year, second year. We know that even in countries like Libya and Tunisia and Egypt, the Middle East, these are worse prisons than Guantanamo. But we know that these prisons, usually people are tortured for a couple of months and then they live normal life inside their cells. But under those conditions in Guantanamo, it was a continuous for six to seven years. They were relentlessly, uh, you know, continuously to uh, subjecting us to, to all si sorts of abuse. And that was, uh, I think it was very ugly to, to, to know about. It was very sad. I was very surprised that, uh, as I say, it's not because they're Americans, but I was very surprised that any human being can go to down to that level. It was an extreme that i never seen in my life, as I've described it before. It was a sadness that I have never, uh, I have never experienced in my life before. It was, uh, you know, it was the extremes of, of, of feelings, I think. Describe Omar that. Gaze, what about the Quran? Um, we heard <laughs> stories about... Uh, yeah, religious. They, they, yeah, definitely. They, they thought, I think it's a stupid thing to do. And it's, they had a policy where they thought that uh, they'd use any, anything and everything to, to uh, break people down. And they thought if they broke you down, it would have been a better source of information. They can extract more information. So they used religious uh, disrespect to Quran. They used to throw the Quran in toilets, kick it like a football in background, uh, threw it, uh, in, as I say, in toilets. That they used to use it in, in interrogation. Sometimes inside the interrogation, if they wanted to uh, irritate people and cause some kind of uh, riots, they'll throw it to the floor in front of uh, an, an uh, someone who is a prisoner, and then they 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 throw on it by their feet. Or sometimes if you go to a cell, like inside those Oscar cells, which were isolation cells, you open the Qur'an and you find uh, writings, abusive writing in it, like effing Qur'an and effing this religion. Or sometimes you find somebody's feet, you know, boots are stamped inside the Qur'an and things like that. And they used to use it so much and uh, they used to, you know, swear against Islam, against uh, our religion, against our Prophet, uh, about Allah, God and so on. And we used to say to them, if you say your fight is against Qaeda and only those group of people who have, you know, what has Islam got to do with it? Why are you uh, abusing the Quran? Why are you making fun of prayers? Why are you doing all these things? And uh, I don't know, some, some, some of the interrogators were so stupid to say, if I had the powers, I would have locked up all the Muslims inside Guantanamo Bay. So you were held at Guantanamo for more than five years? Yeah, it was about five years and uh, seven months or six months, I think. When did you hear that you might be released? Uh, it was uh, one month, I think, before we were released. I was told, I, was, I wasn't even told by the Americans themselves, I was... Uh, Taking up. I was locked up most of the time in Camp 5, which is a worse prison than other prisons. I was most of, as soon as they built Camp 5, which was about 2005, uh, I was moved to Camp 5 and I was locked up in Camp 5. So I was in complete isolation. Even before that, uh, in the cells, I was usually locked up in Oscar or November, those isolation cells. So I was in isolation. I didn't know nothing. Then they moved me. They have moved me to a... Uh, another caged prison cell, which is not usual to, for me to be put in those cages. They put somewhere, uh, Jamil Banna next to me, another prisoner who is from this country, and he told me the news. He said to me that he met the lawyers, and the lawyers told him that we'd be released soon. Did you get to see your lawyer in Guantanamo? I, I did meet the lawyers. Uh, my lawyer was Clive Stafford Smith, who has done so much for Guantanamo and he worked so hard and he was hated uh, by many people. I mean, they tried to even accuse him of, of things when he came to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, he, he endlessly, you know, campaigned to make Guantanamo what it was. 
So did many other lawyers, really. I mean, so many American lawyers were, uh, uh, so, some of them were honest and uh, brave, and uh, they had they had good conscience to to stand by the truth, and they did a lot. Like people from where were were appointed from the CCR, and and other organizations who, who worked tirelessly and and still are. You know, there are some lawyers, which. Uh, which deserve respect. They've worked hard and they were brave enough to, to, to change the things. Yeah, I've met the lawyer, but not the last year. The, the, the last year in Guantanamo, I had some problems with my lawyer, even though he worked hard and good. But we had some problems and issues. I told him I won't work with him inside Guantanamo because it wasn't so difficult for us. Because if he was to do anything outside, uh, even if we objected, we weren't able to say anything because we were inside prison. I heard our voices weren't heard outside, so I didn't meet the lawyers. We, I've, uh, I've stopped meeting the lawyers until I was released, and then now I still uh, meet him and uh, work with him closely. Actually, I work. Uh, one of my jobs are working in Reprieve, which is uh, the organization which uh, Clive Stafford Smith has has uh, founded. And I also work with many other organizations in England, like Cage Prisoners and Guantanamo Justice Center and, and many other law firms. Uh, Omar, if I may, this is Almerindo. Uh, can you yeah. tell a little bit about the medical personnel there, psychologists, psychiatrists, or, or physicians? Yeah. yeah, that's another sad you know, side of uh, the story, is that like, even doctors, which I never imagined that they went to a level uh, that uh, they, the doctors were part of the interrogation. The doctors who were working in Guantanamo Bay used to uh, work closely with interrogation. Sometimes people were very sick. Uh, they had kidney failures or problems and they start screaming and shouting. The doctors will come in and uh, he'll look at them and he, you see, he'll give them, well, if he wanted to, he'll give them sometimes relief tablets. But he say, no medicine, I can't do anything until you cooperate with your interrogation. This is something that used to be uh, largely, I mean, if you are, uh, speak to anyone in Guantanamo, he'll tell you about that. And we used to, one of the most frightening thing to us when we were locked up in Guantanamo is that we feared that we will be, we will be, um, we will catch any disease or any illnesses because that disease will be badly used against you. Because we saw lots of people who were, uh, who had even operations, sometimes they had uh, young junior doctors just, I don't know why they did that. They, they probably had somebody in the army or, or family relative who, they, they came in and to, to make like complicated uh, operations on people. They use people like experiments and most of this, uh, these operations were failures. That some, one guy had a heart operation like nearly eight or nine times. Every time they say it failed, it failed, it failed. Another person, his name is uh, Saleh Yemeni, this is the heart failure. Uh, Abu Imran al taifi another uh, man from Nigeria, they've, uh, they've amputated his leg, and then they say the operation was a failure, then they amputated it again, and then they did something else again. It was like endless. And this was, it's not once or twice, this is, was the practice. That if you agreed to have an operation, serious operation inside Guantanamo, it's usually junior, unexperienced doctors who are using Guantanamo as a training field, maybe because of their some connection with somebody in the military, a colonel or somebody who was their uncle or something like that. And, and because of that, people had serious illnesses sometimes. Even when they were offered an operation, they were scared to take it because of uh, people who were uh, in front of us, who, who were experiencing all these kind of things. So the doctors were working very closely with the uh, interrogators. Some of them, the psychic doctors were, they, they stand there in, in interrogation, they, they, they assess what to be said against you and what is not to be said, what is to be used. Because every person in Guantanamo was differently treated. Uh, that's why every person, I think, uh, has a lot to say in Guantanamo, because every person has been treated completely different than the other person. They, they call it, uh, phobias, they use phobias. So every person has different, they think, have different fears about something in particular. And that thing in itself will be used against him more than others, or he will be mistreated in a different way than others. 
So that's why they had guards going all the time around the cages, all the time. Like uh, Terry will tell you, like every hour they had to write down what every prisoner was doing each hour. They will t say he's sitting down, he's laughing, he's uh, exercising, he's sleeping, he's depressed. And they used anything, even your family connections, your letters to your families. I, for example, me and my wife, I didn't receive any letter uh, from my wife for seven years inside prison, N neither did she. I wrote a lot to her, she wrote a lot to me, but we, both of us, didn't receive any letters. And when I came out from prison, I say, why? She was saying to me, why did you not? Uh, our marriage actually uh, completely broke because of that. And uh, many people's uh, ties and relationship with their families were broken because of uh, the abuse and the censorship that, uh, that, that they, they used everything. Every means was, uh, was lawful to those people in, in, in uh, Guantanamo, sadly. Well, Marty Gaines, I think this would be a good time to bring in uh, Terry, Terry uh, to bring in Terry Holbrooks also. Uh, well, Terry, you said you'd rather be referred to as Mustafa Abdullah. First, tell us about changing your name. Um, it was actually kind of a slow process that took place in Guantanamo. Uh, I developed a reputation with a good number of the detainees as sort of being uh, the good guard or the nice guard or uh, maybe even lax. We can go with lax or lenient. Um, nonetheless, uh, after I started taking interest in the Quran and studying the Quran and talking with the detainees about Islam and just taking more of an interest in that and their lives and the culture and society and history and everything else behind what was going on. Where were you born? Uh, in here, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, after I started taking interest in all of that, uh, the, the, the detainees, some of them started calling me Istafa, others started calling me Mustafa, and I, I didn't have an understanding at this point in time what the relevance was uh, of that name or the significance of that name. Um, I, I think it was uh, Ahmed Irachidi, as a matter of fact, who, who told me to go home and to read Surah 2, Abakra. And that I would find out the relevancy of that name. Um, evidently, it's, uh, it stands for the chosen one. It's uh, one of the names of the Prophet Muhammad. So I, I can only assume, based off of being given a name like that, that evidently they held me in high respects. How did you end up at Guantanamo? Where do you want me to start? Wherever you want. Okay. Wow, that's, that, that's a long story. We don't have enough time for that. that that's kind of like his story. We don't have enough time for all of it. Um, I graduated high school early. I, I was kind of bored with high school real quickly. I was probably bored in middle school, actually. In any case, I was bored with high school. And um, I graduated early. I went to a trade school, a uh, conservatory of recording arts in Arizona, and studied audio engineering. Uh, after I finished that, I was kind of starting to go down the same avenue that my parents had both gone down. Um, alcohol and, and other just issues that I'd rather not discuss. And um, I, I didn't want to be like them. I, I wanted to amount to something and to be able to, to have pride and, and feel respect for myself. So I suppose kind of out of an act of desperation or perhaps out of an act of boredom, um, maybe just because I've always thrived on structure and order, I'm not entirely sure. There was a number of things that went into it, but I decided to join the Army. I uh, went to the recruiters initially in the beginning of 2002, and uh, I walked into the recruiters, and I said, you know, hey, how you doing today? What, what can we do for you? And I was like, I, I want to get a job, I want to get paid to kill people, and I want the least amount of responsibility. I don't think they took me seriously. Um, they kind of laughed, they talked to me, and gave me a pamphlet, and sent me on my way. And I was just sort of, you know, kind of confused, like, wait a second, hold on. I've seen all these movies where, where you know, the recruiters come to schools and they pick you up at your house, and these guys just gave me a pamphlet and sent me on my way. That doesn't make any sense. So I came back a week later and, and tried the same thing. You know, I was like, I want to join the military. What do I have to do? And eventually, after about two or three months of persistence, they eventually took me to take my ASVAB. Um, scored, you know, off the roof with the ASVAB. They offered me, you know, any job that I wanted in the military. And that was probably when I made that fatal mistake that got me to Guantanamo. I asked, um, what job is giving a bonus? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not a smart question. 
So for two thousand dollars, I chose military police. Um, I, I would have much rather have gone ling- linguistics or journalists or uh, even psyops or human intelligence collector. There's just a number of other MOSs that would have been a lot more interesting. But uh, no, I, I took military police. So um, I started the army in August two thousand and two. Graduated basic training in December. Uh, had a two-week break between December and January. Um, met my my ex-wife, well, soon-to-be wife, but now ex-wife. I met her in that break. Uh, we got married in February of '03, and by March or April of '03, there was already rumors that we were getting ready to be deployed. I had just recently gotten married, so I didn't think to myself, you know, what's this Guantanamo place? What what's this about? You know. Why are we going here? What's going on? I was more concerned about the idea that I just got married. You know, my, my wife gave up her entire life to uh, come here and be with me in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. And now I'm going to be leaving her for a year, and she's got no friends, no family, nothing out here. But um, in any case, you know, I was just spending the last little bit of time that I had before I went to Guantanamo, uh, basically just spending time with her, just trying to get as much family time in as I possibly could. I never even once thought about the, the possibility of Googling Gitmo. But uh, that, that's the journey of the military. That's, that's how we got into the Army. And what was your first experience of Guantanamo? Why is it so bright? It's, it's really hot. Why is it so bright? Somebody use a dimmer switch for the sun, please. It's really bright. Uh, that, that place is horrible. I mean, awfully, it, it, it's, 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 oh, wow. I'm at a loss for words, really, to describe Guantanamo. Do you want to perhaps describe Guantanamo a little bit, Omar? I I, I hated it. Like the, the actual climate, I hated. Yeah, it's a bad place. I mean, it's a bad place. I mean, it's been described so much in the media by many people, people from the CIA, people from the FBI who work there, people who are former guards like uh, Mustafa and uh, Chris and, and others. It's been described by many people from the United States themselves. And because people, when we speak, they, they might disbelieve or not completely believe, but when they hear from you, uh, Mustafa, and from others who are from the other side of the wire, it's different. It makes a big difference. So probably it's best if you tell them a little bit about how, how it did, how, it, how they used the lights, you know, the bright lights against us in thy cells, how, how they used us like animals inside there. He probably never had a single night's sleep in the dark the seven years, or, or excuse me, the six years that he was there. Uh, there, was, there was constantly lights on, daytime, nighttime. At yeah. nighttime, there was floodlights as well as there was lights in the, every individual cell. Yeah. It wouldn't make a difference yeah, if I... Go ahead. Steam air conditioning used to be used like uh, we in Camp Fire. We had all the time very cold. It was like living inside a refrigerator. When we were in Moscow, uh, isolation before Camp Fire, when I was locked up, it was like, if you can imagine, it's not like the cages you see in, in the television. Moscow is like an isolation where you have complete the iron sheets. I mean, the walls are made of iron, completely closed. The, you can't, it's not like where you can see anybody. And then the whole walls, it's very small, smaller even than those normal cages. And the floor is made of iron sheets, the, the ceiling is iron sheets. And then you have air conditioner, which is very, very high inside that iron, you know, small box of iron. And it's like you feel inside it, you, you're there for years sometimes, and, and it's like living inside a refrigerator. And, you know, again, under extreme lights. If you imagine six or seven years, you're under light, you cannot, uh, you know, you're sleeping for six years, you're living inside the bright lights. So. Most of all, if you speak, I've been living most of the time. Outside of the constant light and obviously the temperature issue with, uh, with the cold, um, there was two species that were on the island that, that we were not allowed to touch, to do anything with, etc. that we had to give them, you know, privilege to just kind of do what they please. Uh, there was these giant iguanas that would grow to about six feet in length. They're, they're basically like little dragons. I, I remember sometimes when they go running up and down the blocks, some of the detainees would be frightened. The other detainees would just kind of laugh. Or... They had better protection than the detainees. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You weren't allowed to touch them, but you're all right. you were allowed to abuse the detainees and do what you like with the detainees. But right. as long as if you touch one of them, you'd be fine. How much? Thousands of pounds. It, it was something ridiculous like that. It was a thousand or two thousand dollars for touching them or the banana rats. And the banana rats, mind you, these things were. Uh, 
maybe like four month old puppy Rottweilers. I, they're gigantic rats, uh, and it, it, you just you couldn't touch them. You couldn't chase them. Like it, it just took off with my lunch. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, go buy another one. That's that's not right. In any case, uh, 98 degrees all the time. It's on the ocean front, obviously, so you know, 98 degrees, 100% humidity. It, it, the land is burned and barren and miserable. It's just cactus and dirt. It's awful. Did you see any prisoners tortured? Is this being recorded? Uh, yeah, uh, on a number of occasions I, I saw um, what I would consider to be torture. Uh, I draw a fine line personally between what I say is abuse and what I say is torture and um, much like Omar was saying it, it kind of it's a great disgrace to myself when I remember some of the things I saw down there because it was in fact just 100% torture it, it's uh, it, it's not some type of physical or emotional abuse it, it's it's torture like what oh how foul do we really want to get on this uh, obviously, uh, we, we've had the availability with some of the declassified memos that that took place. Um, the the working canine dogs, you know, those would be those would be put in uh, in front of detainees that would be chained to the ground, and these dogs would be riled up and barking, and literally within an inch of a detainee's face. I think sometimes detainees were bitten. I, I never saw that, but I saw evidence of it afterwards. I never saw it directly. Um, the stress positions, you know, six, eight, 12 hours of being inside a room that's 40 degrees with a strobe light in front of you in the same awful Celine Dion song for 12 hours. I, I, I hear little rumors of laughter, but I mean, honestly, any song for 12 hours, especially Celine Dion, that's, that's awful. It's absolutely awful. The, the stress positions themselves were specifically designed to induce muscle failure within the victims as well as bowel failures. And it wouldn't be uncommon that, you know, detainees would, uh, you know, have excrement or, or urinate on themselves while they're being interrogated. It wasn't out of fear. It was strictly out of stress. Um, there, there was an incident that took place. What I think to be the most frightful of the incidences that I saw take place, I kind of cut the beginning of this and a tail end of this, um, we took a detainee from Sierra Block to, uh, to interrogation, and what was odd about it was we didn't take him to interrogation outside of that camp. We took him to interrogation at the camp over by the GIF, which is the, uh, the Joint Interrogational Force, uh, but that's where all the individuals who are in charge of interrogation, that's where all of them kind of have their offices. It's probably where the majority of the worst interrogation took place, I would imagine, would be there or the General's Cottage, one of the two. But um, this individual was brought in and he was sat down, and what was odd about it was it was a female interrogator. And it wasn't so much that it was odd that it was a female interrogator. It was a female interrogator, and she was, you know, kind of scantily dressed, so to say. You're in a military uniform, but you don't have your top on. You're just running around with your brown undershirt and, and, and the pants, and it's just kind of weird to see anybody out of uniform, especially officers. Officers obviously have a certain standard they have to hold themselves to, and uh, she wasn't you know wearing her headgear she didn't have her top on it just kind of a little odd um in any case i i saw this uh, detainee and we took him into there and we chained him down and uh the linguist came in and the interrogator came in and they asked us to leave which was obviously standard protocol mps weren't ever usually i i, I can't say never but we weren't usually present for interrogations we took them and we brought them back but we weren't ever inside in any case, we stepped out to have a cigarette, and uh, myself and my, the friend that I was working with at that point in time, we didn't necessarily want to go back to work. We didn't want to go back to the block or, or pick up other detainees or anything. So we just kind of hid out there and smoked a few cigarettes and went and had lunch and then came back and smoked a few more cigarettes. And uh, I don't know, about an hour, hour and a half later, this detainee is being brought out by two other interrogators, and he's crying. And he's just screaming and it's stark raving mad. And he's got um, what looks like blood on his face. And, and you know, I'm kind of like, wow, I wonder what happened. I mean, you know, I haven't seen anything like that before. Well, evidently what it took place was while he was in interrogation, uh, one of the uh, 
one of the, the, the interrogator, the female interrogator, had, had set something up behind the detainee, either the blood capsules or, or a red marker or something like that. And she, throughout the process of the interrogation, was making sexual comments and sexual advances to him, um, you know, perhaps touching him in inappropriate ma- means uh, and talking about certain things, you know, sexual acts that can be performed between a man and a woman and, and then making references to the Prophet Muhammad at the same time. And um, evidently she went behind this detainee and put her hand into her pants and came back around to the front side of this detainee and the detainee saw her hand come out of her pants and then she wiped this red liquid across his face. Right. So he was under the impression that, that this Actually, was... It's not, the, the, it's not the red liquid. I know the man. The man, the, he was a young kid. His name is Abdul Hadi. He's from Syria. And after they did this to him, they took him back to the blocks, to the cages, and he had to wash his face. It wasn't... Uh, sadly, it wasn't, you know, like she described afterwards. She said it was only red liquid. But it wasn't. It was like uh, uh, dirty blood from herself. She used it on his face. But afterwards, when she was interrogated and asked, it was came, came out in the news. She said, "I was using red liquid." It wasn't the case. I was there in the cages. So he's a young boy. His name is Abdul Hadi, Syrian, and it, it was really she used uh, her own. Uh, right, right, right. How, yeah. How in fact does he know that? I, mean, it's, I can obviously think of a couple of answers, but just how in fact did he know? Because I'd hate to think that, that actually so, really did take place. So you gotta call me. How, how, in fact, does he know that's what happened? Because I would hate to think that actually took place. Yeah, because, you know, he had to wash it. He went, he went back with it in the, to the cell. Right, I remember. We, we cell, took him back. And he had to wash it. And you can tell, you know, the, the smell and the dirt in it and the stuff. It's not like normal, uh, normal just red ink or red liquid. Uh-huh. It was like uh, stuff like that. But anyway, that's, uh, I'm sorry to... No, no, it's, I, I was always under the impression that it wasn't true. Yeah, yeah, we were given the instructions to take him back to the block and then turn the water off in his cell. What they were ultimately trying to do was we weren't going to turn the water on for four days. It was basically just to inadvertently stop him from being able to pray. You know, yeah. If he wasn't able to present himself properly, then that was the idea that they were going for. Uh, the, the story that was also told by uh, Eric Saar, the, the uh-huh. translator. Yeah, the sergeant, he was a uh, sergeant also in translation, I remember Terry, the use of psychologists, psychologists, did you see how they were used? Actually, what's interesting about that, I'm surprised Omar didn't bring it up. Um, every time we were going inside or outside of an interrogation building or, uh, or, or the visit rooms or anything like that, did you ever happen to read any of those posters that were on the wall? You know, like the posters with the little boy, you know, like where, where is your dad for this id? Did you ever read any of those? Did they ever have an effect on you? Uh, which one do you mean, say again? Like, like, you remember the id posters where it showed the little boy and he didn't have a family? Basically, oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, sometimes they had them in the rec yard. This was new, like after 2000, yeah, I remember, after 2005, they had posters, uh, in, yeah, I remember. No, they don't have any effect. You just kind of blindly looked at him and laughed? Yeah. It's just uh, it's, that's what I figured was going to be the overall impression of those. Um, there was posters that were, uh, were up over the camp, you know, various places in the camp that uh, they depicted, you know, a, a broken family or, or a child without his father or um, a woman going through hardship or struggles because, you know, her husband's gone and there's no provider. And they'd be written in various languages, uh, you know, Pashto and Urdu and Arabic and... Uh, I guess the, you know, the, the initial design behind them was just to get people thinking about home and longing for home, but I would imagine you know, wrongly being accused of something or not being accused and being taken away from your family, you don't really need posters to remember home. <laughs> In any case, that was their idea for, uh, for psychological abuse. What, what about the use of the Quran? Yeah, wow. That was an awful day. That was, uh... So... One of the biggest problems about Guantanamo, and Omar brought this up, um, we were both there under General Miller. I served under General Miller the entire time that I was there, and uh, you had to deal with his whole tyrant. I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's, that's awful. Yeah. Um, every time a new commander would come in, whether it was a, a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, 
or, or you know, one star, two star general, etc. They would go through the SOP, the standard operating procedures, and they'd basically take out what they didn't like and put in what they did want it to be or how they're reinterpreting the laws that were coming. So every time that we learned the rules, that we were finally comfortable and content with the rules, there was a new SOP given to us with new rules to learn. So basically, there was just never a standing basis upon what the rules were. We were constantly just learning over and over and over the rules. And uh, it really made for a very ineffective environment. But in any case, I'm, I'm sorry. Quran. Yeah, yeah, the Quran. I was trying to avoid that, but you went back. Um, what the rules were in regards to it was that we were supposed to wear medical gloves. We were supposed to touch it respectfully. And, and and that when we were to open it to you know to look in it for any type of suspicious items, I really can't imagine what you could hide in a book when you can't hollow it out. But in any case, uh, you know, we would take it, flip it like this upside down, you know, flip the pages real fast and set it back down. They were supposed to be put in surgical masks that were supposed to be hanging in the cells. And like I said, we were supposed to use gloves. Only one person was supposed to touch it, and we were supposed to use our right hand only. Um. That was the SOP. That was the rules. That's what some of us followed. Uh, unfortunately, what made my life a lot harder while I was down there was some people would decide that they weren't going to wear gloves. Some people would use their left hand. Some people would, you know, intentionally toss it on the ground to try to rile up detainees or, or, or to, you know, stimulate trouble. I can only think of a number of occasions that I ever saw it kicked or thrown into a toilet. It's not to say that it didn't happen. I can just only think of a handful of them. It really wasn't that many, but when it happened, obviously there was a great reaction. It was a terrible reaction every time, uh, kind of like flu shot day. You you remember that day, flu shot day? Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked for I worked for twenty four hours that day. They had every unit at work because we were just it was constant earth after earth. What do you mean earth? Oh. <laughs> uh, what Omar was, was speaking about, uh, emergency reaction force, emergency response force, uh, the exact nomenclature eludes me at this moment. Um, basically, he described it perfectly. It's, it's five men who are getting their rocks off by running into a, a small cell and ramsacking and beating a detainee unnecessarily. Um, I was surprised he didn't touch on the OC spray. Um, there was a number of times uh, the lieutenants were, were in charge of the OC spray. And when the lieutenant would come out, you know, the standard operating procedures is supposed to do, you know, like a little Zorro Z of, of OC spray across the face. Um, I'd see cans, can upon can drenched on a detainee. OC. OC, uh, I forget the, what it stands for. It's a, yeah, it, it's, it's basically. A, it's, thank you. Thank you. It's yeah, a it's a sixty proof spray. It's very strong. It's a, it's a blinding pepper spray. When it comes to your eye, it blinds you. Can't see anything, and it makes you scratch. It hurts. So, um, you know, having a can of that doused on you, it, it's far more than necessary, especially if you were on Mike November or Oscar block. All three of those were isolation blocks. Uh, if you were in a closed room, and, and you had a can of this stuff you know, doused all over you, and then five men come running in, well, you can't breathe, and you can't see, and you can't defend yourself, and they beat you, step on you, you know, smash your hand and your feet into the doorway, and put your head into the toilet, and flush the toilet repeatedly, and then you'd be taken into the rec yard, and you would just be left there, they'd shave your beard, and just leave you humiliated, and I didn't really understand the purpose of it, but nonetheless, that's uh, that was Earth's. And flu shot day, we don't need to talk about that. What happened on flu shot? No, we don't, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> flu shot day was just long and drawn out, and it had a ridiculous cause and a ridiculous ending. What was the cause? Um, we started this day very simply. Uh, we went into the camp. We had our briefing. Uh, there was a couple of medical personnel at the briefing, which was a little unusual. Uh, usually it was just the platoon sergeants and um, the camp leader. But in any case... Uh, we had our briefing, and these medical personnel said that we were going to be issuing flu shots. We started over in Camp 4, which is the minimum security camp. It's communal living. Um, that's actually where I started working when I was in uh, Guantanamo. I was in Camp 4. That was my first two months was in Camp 4. Um, it's a completely different environment. It's, uh, it's relaxed. It's a 
open communal, like I said, you know, they can have breakfast together, they can pray together, they have board games and books and all kinds of other such uh, luxuries, so to say. Yeah, but you had 100 out of 800 people locked up, or at the time you were there, about 600 were locked up at the other prisons. And this prison we speak about, they had about 100 more or less. Oh, no, less than that. More, more like 65, yeah. 70. But in any case, we started over in Camp 4 issuing these shots, and everything went fine on Uniform and Whiskey and Victor Block. We got the X-ray block, and one of the older men, I guess, fainted from the sight of the blood or getting a shot. I don't know. He fainted. And, you know, a detainee sees this, this old man faint. And he's like, oh, my God, they're poisoning us. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. And... You know, he starts saying it, and then it spreads through all four of the blocks for, for Camp 4. And I, Omar, I commend you guys. I still don't know how you did it, but you had an amazing communication system in Camp Delta. <laughs> in five minutes, you guys could get a message from one side of the camp to the other. We couldn't accomplish that with the radios and cell phones. So congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah, I heard that comment from the inside from the interrogators. They said... They've tried, they've sent the rumor, they tried to realize how, how long does it take to go from one side of the prison to the other side of the prison. They say it took about three minutes to go from one in the lockup to, to the least uh, far away prison. And mind you, that's going through at least seven different languages as well. You know, it, it wasn't like playing telephone where we're just playing in English. And No, you, you're going from Arabic to Urdu to Pashto to Uyghur to French. It's just like, really? Wow, that's, that's amazing. How would you guys do that? In any case, um, he he faints and whatnot, and and this this guard start or these these detainees start you know preaching. Oh my God, they're trying to kill us. The guards are trying to kill us. Don't get the shot, and that spread through the entire camp in the course of five minutes. And what started off for me as a simple eight hour, two o'clock to ten o'clock shift became a two o'clock to noon the next day shift. They called in the two units that were supposed to be sleeping or off. They called them in as well to provide reinforcements because we had the same unintelligent is the most uh, nice word I can think of. Um, the same unintelligent individuals running in and, and, and smashing detainees over and over and over. And eventually you had to give them a break. And when we realized that we were going to be earthing 38 out of 48 detainees per block, it really just became necessary to have, you know, the, the more soldiers. We had to have more manpower. And then when you had people like me who were constantly dipping out, being like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go put on my earth gear. And I just kind of fade to the background and go hide and smoke cigarettes and whatnot. I, I wasn't a fan of the earthing. It, it just didn't really strike me as being effective or humane or civil. So I did everything I could to possibly get out of that. And I was very fortunate in the fact that there was always individuals who were ready and willing and excited to to volunteer to go on Earth. You know, it wasn't something you volunteered for. There was five of us that were designated to do it every shift, but people could volunteer, and if they were ready before I was, then they were the ones who went in. So when they'd call over the radio that there was going to be an Earth, I'd walk to the other end of the block as far away as the exit could possibly be and, I don't know, find something else to do. Uh, a question for Omar. Uh, you were there when the three suicides took place in one night. Yeah, I was, I was there when uh, that happened, uh, and the three suicides, and then there's another uh, person who died. We don't know what happened exactly, but some people, we know that it was, it was to do with sexual abuse that did happen. There was a policy where they did, they did, they did annoy us, they did something sexual really badly to, to those people. And uh, I remember speaking to one of them, not the three, the man who died afterwards. Al-Ami, Abu Talha Al-Ami. And I remember him being very angry and annoyed and shouting behind the, the windows and he said, are they doing the same thing to your block as what they're doing to us? And I said, yes, they are. And, uh, and after that, he died a couple of days after that. The three people, Yasser Zahani and the others, they, they, they hated so much because of their continuous uh, resistance, they were young men, most of them were very young, like in their 80s, 90s, when they were locked up. And they, they, they had lots of problems in, because of interrogation, because of, uh, like what uh, Mustafa was saying, when they entered their cell, they used to fight back. 
and they really hated them so much and they designated them to real mistreatment. Uh, I remember one of them had problems, he, had, he needed an operation on his, uh, he had a really serious problem and they, they used again, because he was so sick, they did the operation and then they used it against him and then they locked him up in, uh, in, in very severe cold conditions and he was really, really badly physically uh, affected. And then we heard, one day, you know, we heard that three of them died. So yeah, I was there and it was a really sad, sad occasion. And after that happened, the treatment in England town, there was a policy where they, they, they even more abuse was, uh, people were more subjected to even more abuse and more restricted, uh, very hard uh, conditions. So it was a really bad time, I remember that very well. There's been recent uh, controversy about that. Uh, there's been new studies that yeah. uh, shed uh, questions yeah. about the fact that they were suicide. Yeah, that's why. That's what I think. I, we, that's why I didn't use the word suicide because I don't think it's suicide. It's possibly that what happened to them is very unclear. As I say, these three people, Mana, al Atabi, and Yasser Zahrani, and Ali Abdullah Salah, were for a long time subjected to. They were designated to specific mistreatment. And uh, what clearly happened that night, I'm not sure. Because I know one of them, he was hanged and he, his hands were tied. And he, his mouth was, uh, there was cloth filling his mouth and his hand was tied behind his back. So it's, uh, I understand, I heard about the, the, the article that's written about them and I, I have very big, uh, you know, I have a lot to believe in uh, some of the stuff that they've done. Omar, personally, I don't think those could have been suicides. Uh, just, yeah. just having worked there, um, yeah, the, as you so touched on was, earlier, you know, it, it was a requirement that at least hourly we had to take notes upon what was going on in the block. Uh, me, just being antsy and bored like I am most of the time, I would walk up and down the block probably every three minutes. You yeah. know, So with the monitoring system that was in place just in, in, in the poorly constructed camps, let alone Camp 5 and Camp Echo, which are on, under constant video surveillance, yeah, that's true. there's no way that a suicide could take place. There was a number of suicide yeah. attempts while I was there, but we always caught them. It, it wasn't... Definitely. That's, all, that's why I never, I never said in the media that uh, these were suicide, even though I heard that I was there when it did happen. And I never, I never said it's suicide, and I never believed that it was suicide. But I can't say otherwise because I wasn't completely inside the cell. But it's, as you say, it's impossible to do anything like that inside the cell. One of the things that uh, have been noticed is that the, the three of them were taken to a special camp that hadn't been described yeah. uh, up to that point. And the oh, official yeah. or unofficial name of the camp was Camp No. Because yeah. uh, if they asked you if it existed, you had to say no. Have yeah. you heard of that uh, camp? Yeah, I heard about that once, yeah. That's true. Um. Mustafa, did you hear about that camp? Yeah, that perhaps might be what I was told was the general's cottage. Um, there was a place just past Camp Iguana along the ridge line when you're going towards the satellite towers. Uh, I probably shouldn't be that specific. Um, there, there was another camp that's down there. You, you can see it. Uh, if you use Google Earth and you look really carefully, you can see it. It's a small camp, very small. I couldn't hold maybe more than four detainees, but uh, there was another place that I always suspected that when people disappeared for long periods of time, it's where they had to go. Um, uh, Sh uh, Shakira Mir and um, Ahmed Irachidi were two of the, the closest detainees with me. And there's point in times where they left, where they weren't in Camp Delta anymore, and they weren't in Camp Echo. It's just, where have you been, man? Where did you go? I don't know. They put a blindfold on me and put me in a van and drove around for an hour. Well, it doesn't take an hour to get anywhere on that place. It's 54 square miles and a majority of it's water, so it doesn't take an hour to get anywhere. They probably drove around in circles for a while, but nonetheless, um, there, there had to have been somewhere else. It's probably where uh, Camp No, if that's what it's called. I was always told it was the general's cottage. Kind of a yeah. twisted name for place of torture. Omar de Gaze, yeah. describe the day you got out of Guantanamo. What was it like? Well, we weren't very happy, but anything that in Guantanamo happens, 
uh, you disbelieve until it really does happen. So even when I was told that I would be released, uh, I was happy, but I wasn't completely happy because some people were taken in the planes. It was used psychologically. They were taken in the planes and then they were taken back to prison. They say the plane, they had problems with the plane. So until I really came back to England, uh, I was completely happy and I met my family. And uh, yeah, it was one of those happy days that it passed. Did you meet any other guards that um, were kind to you? Uh, yeah, there were, there were some reasonable people inside prison. Uh, uh, some people who were more willing to commit uh, atrocities and they were motivated by their own uh, hatred and feelings. And others who usually, there are some few people inside who didn't intend to do, cause harm unless they were commanded to do that. And there was a policy that the generals who were leading those prisons, like Miller that uh, Mustafa was describing and others afterwards who came, they had, they had a policy where they used the guards against the prisoners and then if they saw any, like uh, Mustafa was describing, they saw somebody speaking to one of the prisoners too much or he's befriending him more, the next thing you know is that that same guard will be commanded to enter your cell with other group of guards to beat you up badly. And uh, because of that, because they had that mistrust, they didn't even trust their own guards. I think even the guards were surveillance and they had videos and uh, they, they had informers in between the guards themselves. Uh, so the people who have generated Guantanamo itself, I mean the, pop, the top people who made Guantanamo, were, uh, were people who, who used both the guards and prisoners. And that's why I think those people, not the guards, not the simple guards who were used and abused themselves, but those people should be brought to accountability for their uh, actions. Ms. Daffa, do you agree? Um, wow, that would be an absolutely amazing act if everybody who was responsible for, for the atrocity, for, for the stain that it, that is Guantanamo. Um, it, it would be quite an amazing accomplishment if everybody responsible could be convicted or tried or even remotely punished in this life. That that would be an amazing act. Um, I would love to see it happen personally. Um, like he was saying, with, uh, with Guantanamo being designed for even the guards to be used as tools, um, just before we went to Guantanamo, literally the day that we were going, um, we stopped. We had this little, you know, layover, so to say, in New York City. Hey, you know, uh, wow, check it out. We got two buses. We're going to take you to Ground Zero. We're going to let you read all the comments on the wall. And while we're there, we're going to tell you that it was Muslims that blew this place up. And it's Islam that is the enemy. And remember, we're going to guard the worst of the worst. Remember that. These are the worst of the worst. So when we get there, don't yeah. talk to them. Don't be friends with them. They are the worst of the worst. I, I was fed that nonsense. Oh, God. Every day, the entire year that I was there, was that these are the worst of the worst, or they're dirt farmers. They're dumb dirt farmers. Don't talk to them. Well, if they're dumb dirt farmers, why are they lawyers and doctors, and why can they speak seven different languages properly when I can't even speak English properly, and I grew up in America? How, how are they dumb? How does this correlate here? I don't understand. Uh, this, General Miller used to go around and used to say to the, uh, the guards before they entered your cell, I beat you up badly, they said, don't forget September 11. Uh, and used to go around and uh, incite that kind of hatred. And the same general who afterwards, the, the top people like Dick Cheney and uh, Bush and whoever was putting those people to work, thought he did a good job in the town. They moved him to Abu Ghraib in Iraq. And he was the same person who said, let's contonomize. Abu Ghraib, and then, uh, you know the pictures that came out from Abu Ghraib and all this was at the same period that this same General Miller, who they thought his policies were successful in Montana and breaking people down, they moved him to Iraq to do the same job. And, uh, you know, probably, uh, as I say, uh, even Mustafa and some guards were, don't know so much about what went inside some of these, uh, some of these prisons. I mean, even interrogators were kept away. There were certain guards who were used, as I said, they, they, their job was only to take you to, to the interrogation cells and then go back. And then they come and take you, pick you up back again. They didn't know what happened inside interrogation cells. Even some of the interrogators, I had some, one of the uh, 
late until he was a he was a guy from Florida and he was a kind a kind generous person compared to many uh, of the other interrogators and he and he tried to help and he tried to do things different he said I might be in your position one day and and, and he and he was a better than other interrogators and even as I say even interrogators what I want to say is that uh, they were different they used some of them to do certain acts and some of them were, didn't even know that those acts and those things did happen that's why it's always uh, the more we speak about to, to people who worked in Guantanamo, they, they, were, they were given different jobs to do. As, uh, there, were, there were people who were inside those, set, inside those interrogations. There were people who were sexually, like, you know, raped and abused. There were four people in background base. There were, four of them were chained in a tent. And four of them were sodomized in front of each other to embarrass them. Uh, there were... Uh, somebody in, in the dark prison, an African guy, I don't want to mention his name, an African guy who was, again, he was sexually abused, sodomized, and then after that they said to him, we realize it's a mistake, that you haven't, you're not a guy, they released him, and they said you're a brave man, they said to him you're a brave man, you're, just to, to psychologically try to amend what they've done to him, uh, and again, the same thing, inside Guantanamo Bay, there were people who were chained down to the floors, chained like, I don't want to mention his name, because some, some of those people told me those stories because of my work with lawyers inside prison, but they insisted I don't give their names. This man is a young Yemeni boy, and he, uh, and he, and uh, he, he was held, one day he was held in those prisons, his, his uh, trousers was pulled back, and, uh, you know, there are lots of, Abuses like that, sexual abuses. Like, uh, another guy from China, a young boy from China. Uh, and another, you know, uh, detailed, horrible stuff that happened to him, uh, and so on. So there, there are many stories, and and each, as I say, each prisoner is treated different than the other prisoner. If you're young, and you come from the Middle East, there's certain things that are done to you more. Then if you're an older person and you come from Europe, for example, you were subjected to a different kind of torture. It, it, was, it was different. Every torture was engineered uh, to use the utmost uh, harm that can be done to you psychologically, uh, sometimes physically. What do you mean they told you these stories because you had legal background? Yeah, I had, I had legal background and uh, when Clive Smith came in, I was, uh, Clive did lots of good work, that he was, he was more brave to publish, but he, he was censored, so much of the things that he had to publish was, had to go through the censors, but he was, uh, he was more, uh, more active in speaking, and he, was, he did lots of uh, good work, and when we saw the results of his work, people started to confine and came to me inside the cells, and used to send me messages, and uh, letters, in different ways and forms, like uh, Mustafa said, we had different ways to communicate with each other, even though we were disallowed, we weren't allowed to communicate with each other. They were starting to send me confidential uh, things that happened to each one of them, on the, on the condition that I don't mention exactly their names, I could mention who they are, like generally. There was another Bahraini guy, Saudi Bahraini guy, who was chained down to the floor and he was uh, sexually abused by a, a female interrogator and things like that. So they, they, they mentioned their stories, but because it's so embarrassing, some of the stuff I am, myself, I am not able even to uh, uh, describe in detail because I feel ashamed and embarrassed of describing the stuff that did happen. What has been most difficult to uh, adapt to since you've been freed? Uh, there's many, th th well, when, when I was free, there were many things I needed to, to, to uh, fix and amend. It was, because we were so many years far away from, uh, from freedom, we had lots of things. Our family was away, we had to try to communicate with my family who was lost. My wife and child was lost, we didn't know where they were, I didn't know where they were. We were in Pakistan and Afghanistan borders, I had to search for them. It was so difficult because every person you, you communicate with in Pakistan would be under surveillance because of my background. Uh, it was so difficult to make communication with them. 
and then you had lots of things, you know, how to speak with people again, how to become normal. Because we were locked up, I was locked up more than five, most of those uh, years I was in isolation cells. So it was very difficult to learn how to communicate again with people, to talk uh, in a normal way and socialize in a normal way. It was difficult to, uh, again, to go back to work, to uh, wake up in a normal way, to sleep in a normal way. We had the and we still do experience lots of psychological hardships, dreams, bad dreams. Sometimes uh, some incidents trigger memories back inside the cells. Um, we, uh, our, our emotions is different. Psychologically, our feelings, we're more, uh, we're more uh, cold than what we used to be. We don't have we not easily, we can't express our feelings easily to our families and friends, suspicion, and we suspect everyone and everything. Uh, many, many things that, as I say, that's why when I described in the beginning, the physical, the physical damage that was caused to us probably is more apparent and uh, is hard, but the psychological wounds and injuries inside each one of us is uh, more deeper and uh, probably long, long, longer than, than the physical abuse. And Jerry Mustafa, how do you actually go through the conversion process? And then what was the response of the Guantanamo officers, um, the military, to your conversion to Islam? Um, the when Al Jazeera interviewed me, they, uh, they asked this question, and then off the record they said, this is really the money question. If you could put a lot of detail in this, this is the money question. Yeah, um, and unfortunately it's really not that much of a money answer. Um, uh, uh, to tackle that initially, the, the process of, of converting to Islam, uh, I, I think one should have a full understanding, uh, or at least you know, as much as they're mentally capable of having, uh, of what Islam is, of what it entails, um, of, of the pillars of faith and everything that, that comes along with it. I, I think that that should be there. But uh, it, it's a simple process of saying your shahada, uh, of declaring that there is no God except for Allah and that the, that Muhammad is his messenger, um, and, and meaning it wholeheartedly, you know, meaning it in your heart and full and with clear intent and clear mind and good intentions. Uh, you, you should have, obviously, uh, two other believers present, but... It's a simple process, so to say. Um, Irachidi and I battled about that one for a couple of weeks. I, 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 yeah, uh, sorry, everybody. Uh, Ahmed Irachidi was a prisoner in Guantanamo. Um, he, he actually lost his mind inside prison, didn't he? They mistreated him so badly that he, at uh, one stage, I don't know, you, were, you left, I think, the prison at the time. No, no, no. He, he, no I, I was there for watching his downfall. Yeah, he, he lost it completely. He was uh, injected with uh, injected with injections and stuff that he left. He completely lost his mind. Like I remember looking at him and seeing him like talk in a garbage way. And it was very sad to see that uh, nice man, intelligent man, and then go down to that kind of group uh, because of the abuse he was subjected to. Yeah. Uh, Eric Chidi himself personally had a, a reputa uh, what's the word I'm looking for reputation. Um, we called him the general. He was the general of the detainees because he was the type of individual that... It's crazy how, yeah, that's why they, they describe him as a general and he was, they thought he was somebody very important in Cairo, well, even though that he was working as a cook. Right, right, right. It, it, wasn't so, it wasn't so much because of that, though. I mean, the, the, the military had their ideas that, that he was a leader, but the, the reason why you know, we, we called him the general was because you could have a block that was rioting and he could walk under that block and say one sentence and everybody would be calm. That's true, but, but the interrogators really meant it. I mean, like him, like Shakar Ahmed now inside, locked up inside prison. Right. For nine years, and Shakar Ahmed went the same way. He, they called him professor because he, he was loved by people. Because he's loved for different reasons. Like the Rashidi, they loved because they speak good English and good Arabic and they were older in age. And they used to translate for people and used to try to help them. Yeah, yeah, they, absolutely. They were the problem solvers. Speak in English, and because of that, people respected them and loved them. And and just because of showing that respect to them and love, 
They started calling them names like generals and professors and really intelligent people inside the interrogation. Really did believe that kind of uh, talk. And just because of that, some of them are still uh, longing, in like still are in prison. Uh, just because of what people respect them and how they look at them inside prison. Not because of what they acted and what they've done before. I've seen Shaka's accusation, the things that they, they accused them of in, in, in the paper. It was like flimsy stuff, stuff which he shouldn't be kept for nine years just because of that. Yeah, we uh, we had some colorful and loving pet names for some of the detainees. Obviously, uh, getting getting back to the question, um, Erichidi actually didn't uh, necessarily accept or like the idea initially uh, of me approaching Islam. And I told him, I was like, "Hey, you know, uh, I I think I want to convert. I think I want to actually take up faith. You know, I, I'd never had faith in my life, and and." Islam's the, the one and only faith that's ever made sense to me. So um, he just kind of looked at me the day that I first approached him. He, he turns his head, he looks at me, he's like, no. He just waves his hand and wouldn't say anything else to me for the rest of the day. I was like, are you serious? Dude, we sit and talk for like six hours at a time. You're just going to wave your hand and say no? Like, oh, come on. And he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the day. I saw him a week later and asked him about it and he still said no and... Finally, one night, I was working a night shift, and I came up on him, and I, I, I talked to him. I was like, you know, I really, I, I know my, I've, I've got my P's and Q's. I know about it. I, I want to take, you know, I want to take my Shahada. And uh, he sits me down, and we talked for about two hours, just discussing all the, uh, the stipulations that come across the Islam in, in regards to American society and how living as a proper Muslim totally not going to go hand in hand with each other. But uh, after a long sit-down conversation, you, he eventually gave in and tr he transliterated a shahada for me, so I was able to say it. And um, as for the military, uh, go ahead. But Mustafa, there, there, there's a number of guards who became Muslim, and people don't, don't realize that. They think it's, you're the only person who that did become Muslim inside the town. There's a number of guards who became Muslim now, and there is one female guard who we're still in contact with, and she sent us messages that she said. She, she is wearing a uh, hijab and she has become a Muslim uh, lady. Alhamdulillah. And she message, but she's so scared to come out in the open. And we asked her to, uh, you know, if it's possible for her to speak about it. And uh, we're in contact with her. There's, 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 there's a number of people who, inside prison, we, we would, said we jihad would, and became Muslim. We would be happy to have her testimony anonymously. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we, I'll tell her that because she sent a good message to uh, Muslim Bay. And she said, just tell your friends in London that uh, the, the things that she experienced in single time will change her life completely. And one of the things she said, she said, I remember somebody who comes weak to the cells from another prison. And uh, your, the support you had and the camaraderie you had inside those prison was just uh, admirable. She was impressed by that and how people helped each other inside those uh, horrible conditions. Uh, Omar, we're about to come to the end of this conversation, the um, conference, the video conference will close. Uh, but in the last few days, um, you questioned whether you wanted to participate this in this at all. Can you explain why? Yeah, I was, uh, it, it, was uh, it, it was by coincidence I was the looking at uh, my Facebook and somebody sent me a message on Facebook and he sent me a videotape where an American uh, soldier personnel, I looked at the videotape and in that videotape there was an American uh, soldier in Iraq who was uh, raping uh, a civilian, a woman, an Iraqi woman and he, uh, he filmed that incident and he was bragging about it and uh, it was so sad to see that, that uh, these are atrocities that are still happening inside Iraq, and because uh, that uh, American uh, guards are, uh, or American uh, soldiers are doing these things, and, and by command, by generals and others inside, what happened in Abu Ghraib and many other pictures probably they have, I thought it was uh, it wasn't acceptable that I should be speaking to people who are still committing these uh, atrocities inside uh, those countries. Uh, especially that we know that Obama has refused to uh, publicize some of those pictures who they have in their, in their possession. I mean, the Ministry of Defense has in their possession 
even worse pictures of individuals, American individuals who committed those criminal acts and they haven't Obama, even though he is a lot better than Bush and the previous administration, but he hasn't taken, these people haven't been, been put to accountability. This man's picture is in the internet, and he's doing those crimes, they're so horrible if you just look at it, and he is, he is probably at large, nobody's done anything to him, he's bragging about it, and if America wants to respect itself, this is my message, and if they want to, uh, people take them seriously and this war, if it is a moral war, which it is a moral war and if they want uh, a moral ground uh, they, they, they should prosecute those criminal people who have committed those atrocities so that was the reason that made me think maybe I, I, I shouldn't be participating in this How do you know but, the video uh, is real? Yeah, yeah, the video is real because it's, this is not the only video. There are more. I've seen a couple of videos before, and some of them were women uh, speaking in uh, Al Jazeera, like for example, uh, Sabrina Al Janadi, an Iraqi uh, young woman who described what happened to her, and it is a verified fact. And there are many, many others in Iraq that uh, they, I've seen. I've seen tapes where American guards. Uh, bragging and speaking about, uh, as I say, everybody knows about the lots of photographs that the Ministry of Defense refused to release because they, they said if they release them, it would cause even more uh, agitation in the, in the Middle East because how much bad those uh, uh, pictures were, those video tapes were. And, and what this means, it means that this was happening inside those prisons and uh, inside observation of, of, uh, of officers and people superiors, but those people who committed those crimes probably were encouraged to do that. Otherwise, none, we haven't heard of anyone uh, properly brought to accountability. So what made you decide to participate then? Thank you. Grand talk, talked to me and he said uh, it, it is better to uh, to speak to the people about this and about everything, and we are not, we are not those same people. We are different. We're trying to convince the people in the United States about the atrocities that did happen in this under the, the so-called war on on terror, and uh, we are trying to, uh, we're trying to show the people and try to explain the truth. And if you don't participate in this, only what you are doing is. Uh, it is disappointing us who are trying to organize this and try to explain to the people what re reality is and what really is happening on the ground. Because people usually hear only one side of the story and always to, to, to make a proper judgment you need to hear both sides of the story. Mark, is a reconciliation possible? I think definitely it's possible. Uh, we, uh, of course, I mean, uh, we humans, nobody, nobody wants war. I don't think the Afghani people want war. And they've been badly affected by war. No people in Iraq want their country to be occupied and to be sh uh, shelled and, uh, and tortured and bombed. But reconciliation, we must learn to respect each other. And we must learn to solve our problems uh, not by might and force. We should respect people's perspectives. I mean, some people have different way of looking at things and life. We, as Mustafa was saying, you know, his transformation to Islam, we have different values, we look at things differently, but this doesn't mean that we have to fight each other. We can sit down and we can, uh, we can negotiate and we can understand. I think, uh, as I say, you know, uh, things can only get worse when you use might and force to solve problems. And all of us have families, and we know that, even in our own families. When you try to force your children or force people who are uh, less weaker than you in the family to do something, it never succeeds. But what it does, it causes rebellion and makes things worse.
Omar, Degues, is there anything else you'd like to add as uh, the video probably will go off at any point? Okay, I just uh, really wanted to thank all of you for uh, coming here. It's been a pleasure. And I'm so happy to know uh, people like yourselves who are brave enough to stand by their principles and uh, to uh, advocate, I hope, what is right and advocate at least understanding and listening to the other side. Uh, I'm, as I say, it's been a pleasure to participate. I'm pleased that I have changed my mind and did participate. And I hope, uh, I hope you were able to uh, change things to the better in, in the United States and uh, probably in the world. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a pleasure. You really think reconciliation is possible? I mean, I, just uh, this could totally turn into an absolutely awful conversation. We should probably just have it over Facebook or something via email. I just the amount of restructuring that'd be required in America, both the, you know socially as well as uh, our educational system. There is so much that would have to be done to revamp it to make any type of a, a, a groundwork to lay a bridge of a connection between the East and the West. It's it's inspiring to me, to, you know, to hear that you have hope that that a reconciliation could be possible. I think so. Quite frankly, I'm 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 always surprised and shocked when I hear of another detainee who's gotten out and has not decided to to retaliate. I, I think it's amazing. <laughs> you know, and it's 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 certainly something that I commend all of you for. And in regards to that sister uh, that you were speaking of. Just, yeah. just let her know. It's a responsibility of all of us Muslims. You know, if, we, if we know of social injustice and whatnot that's happening to our brothers and sisters, it's our responsibility to take some type of action towards it. Even if she speaks you know, anonymously, she's, she's still speaking and taking action, and, and that's what's going to help facilitate change. Mustafa, the response of other soldiers, officials, officers to your conversion? Yeah, I managed to actually keep my, uh, my, my uh, religious views and affiliations to myself and relatively quiet. There was only two individuals while I was in Guantanamo that had any knowledge about that, and they, they were individuals that I could trust. They were very far and few that I could trust. Uh, a lot of the same side effects that uh, Omar was mentioning from being in Guantanamo, you know, I, I have as well. You know, I, I still have nightmares about that place. I suffered mass amounts of alcoholism trying to forget it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's awful. But it, I kept it a secret until we got back to Fort Leonard Wood. By the time we got back to Fort Leonard Wood, nobody cared what I was doing at that point. They, they were back with their families and they had their beer and their Playstations and everything else. They didn't care what I was doing. So I became irrelevant at that point and that was the point in time that I felt comfortable enough to talk about it. Um, family and friends haven't had anything negative to say. They're supportive of me and, and, and what I do. At least the people who I still talk with, you know, if, if they want to have a conversation with me, then they're my real friends. If they don't, then they weren't friends to begin with. So what are your plans now? Um, hopefully to get my book out and uh, to, to, I, I have another four drafted in my mind that I would like to write. The next four will be fictitious, however. But uh, I have four more books I'd like to write that will point out a, a lot of comparison and contrasts between the United States and the Middle East and, and hopefully help bridge the gap between the East and the West, help try to create some type of understanding. And Omar, your plans now? No, my plans are simple, just... Uh continue to amend my life and try to uh, to uh, to achieve what is good and try to help those people who are left behind in the time of locked up and many many others in the, in secret prisons and it's uh, I think it's a mission to inform people and help uh, to release them I, I, I graduated when I was young I always wanted to do a human rights law and I did and now I think I'm even in a better position to work in as I am working now a human rights lawyer to help many, many others, I think, who are less fortunate. Because I've been, uh, in my own life, I've experienced how oppression can be, in, you know, when, when it happened to my father and our family in Libya, 
And then when I grew up and went out, uh, went out to Guantanamo Bay and what happened, and I think there's a big, uh, there's a lot that can be achieved by talking and by uh, advocating for, for those rights. Well, we want to thank you both for taking this time and really participating in this historic event of uh, prison guard, uh, prisoner at Guantanamo, talking to each other and sharing with all of us your experiences there. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, outside the door, there's uh, books by Amy Goodman and books by some other author you might know. Um, both of them interesting for people that have attended this meeting. Uh, please look them up and Amy will be signing copies of her book and the other author will also be signing copies of uh, his book. And maybe next time, um, Mustafa Bill will be sitting next to us signing his book as well. In Inshallah. <laughs>